Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cosmic Coffee, our first Cosmic Coffee of 2021. I'm Jeff Hall. I'm the director and an astronomer here at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, and we're glad to be coming back to you with Cosmic Coffee after a brief uh, holiday break for the latter part of December. And I'm joined this morning by our operations manager, Dr. Amanda Bosch. Um, Amanda is relatively new as a staff member here at Lowell. She began uh, as our operations manager last August 1st, but has, has been involved with Lowell as, as long as I've been here, which is uh, since the late Cretaceous at this point. Uh, uh, she came to us uh, from her role at, at MIT. Um, <laughs> So welcome, uh, Amanda, as our operations manager, is, is in charge of, of overseeing the, the operation of these fabulous tools of our trade. And we thought this might be a good start to the, the 2021 Cosmic Coffee. Last uh, uh, June, you may remember, we, we did an episode out at the Lowell Discovery Telescope where we sort of walked around and talked about the different systems uh, and, and uh, how they work and how it all comes together. Uh, today, we're gonna take a slightly different tack into how do we actually use these tools of the trade that allow astronomers to, to do what they do? And it's obviously a facility like LDT is pretty large and complex and takes um, a lot of TLC, not just at night, but during the day. So we're gonna sort of step through that. And then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about the facilities out at Anderson Mesa as well. So thanks for joining us and we'll get going. So um, Amanda, I guess the, the first part of the planned show for today is, you know, we call it a day in the life of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And, and what, what, what we do, and, and it may not be obvious that there's a lot going on during the day as well as during the night. So tell us a little bit about how we keep this fabulous thing going. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting me. And I'm just let me just start by saying I'm very happy to be here in Cosmic Coffee and I'm also at Lowell Observatory working. Um, it's just an amazing place to work and so many fun toys to play with. Mm -hmm. And so I really I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, so, yeah, it's um, I, I know that I've talked with a lot of people over the years and they say, well, you must stay up all night. And sometimes I do stay up all night. Um, uh, but most, of, you know, there's a lot of work that happens during the day as well. And so, in fact, our operations at the LDT, at the Lowell Discovery Telescope, happen 24 hours a day. And so it's 9 a.m. here now, and the day crew has already started out at the telescope. And so they will, just on, a, on, a, on an everyday day, they'll arrive there sometime around 8 o'clock or sometime between 8 and 9 in the morning. And so, you know, you might be wondering, you know, what, do, what is there to do during the day? Well, um, there are a number of things that, you know, just um, regular maintenance and preparation for work that's going to be coming up that need to be happening, you know, every day at the telescope. And so um, the engineers will be working on that. For instance, one of the things that um, they're going to be thinking about soon is the um, plans for the summer shutdown. So in the middle of the summer, um, for about two weeks, usually we have this period where we shut down operations at the telescope during monsoon, so we can't observe anyway. And um, that's a time when we can do things like take the primary mirror out and recode it if it needs to be have a new uh, new reflective coating put on it. And it's also a time when we can do a lot of work on some critical systems without impacting the night, you know, the night observations. So that's one of the things that, you know, that, that doesn't just happen like that. You can't, you can imagine when you have this 4.3 meter mirror, you don't just decide one day, oh, let's take it out. <laughs> well, you want to do that as little as possible. And that shutdown is going to be more like six weeks, typically. That's um, true. Yeah. I always found it kind of amusing that that's a six week shutdown to recoat the surface of that mirror, but actually depositing the aluminum is what, a couple of minutes, I think. <laughs> That's right. But the, there's a lot leading up to it, right? Taking it out very carefully, putting yeah. it into the vacuum chamber, and then the actual deposition doesn't take that much time, but then you have to put it all back. Maybe so, back yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, what we're, what we're looking at, you know, we'll be preparing for those kinds of things. Um, in general, one of the first things that the engineers will do when they arrive is take a look at the night plug. This is um, the, the log from the um, telescope operators from the previous night. And they'll give um, very complete uh, description of what happened last night and 
you know, most of the time, every, the answer is everything worked great, wonderful. And sometimes the answer is, well, we had a problem, you know, with this component, it was making a weird noise, you know, and so um, the, the day crew will go out and, and check it, run, you know, run that particular component and, you know, f find the weird noise and then fix it. Um, cause you don't want to leave things like that for too long because weird noises are bad and a telescope, it generally means weird metal and it's rubbing against metal and yeah. soon is going to fail. <laughs> the, with the $53 million toy you want to pay attention to. Um, Absolutely. really quickly, there's a, a, a question in the chat going back to the, the mirror recoding from, uh, Chris uh, Georgi, is the mirror recoding system in the basement of the observatory? And I know we can answer that. It is actually not. It's it's uh, next door. Um, uh, in it's it's called the Ox Building, the Auxiliary Building, and it's just um, yeah, you, it's just next door to the telescope. In fact, I have a, a an image if I can share that. Um, if that maybe that's this is a good time to do that. Um, so I'm going to have to click through a couple of images first. Whoops. Um, so yeah, you can see it here in this image. It's the green building um, right over here, and the the telescope, you know, is the uh, the tall thing there, and then the green building right behind it. So what happens is, um, can you see my pointer? Yes, I can see the pointer. Okay, great. Um, what happens is we take the mirror out of the telescope. It goes down into the first floor of the telescope here. And then there's a, a bay here, um, large doors that open up on that bay. Um, and then there are some tracks like, like railroad tracks here. And so what we can do is we can just um, just roll the mirror over here and then the tracks go straight into this building. And then at the back of the building right over here, there's a giant vacuum coating chamber. And so then the mirror will just get rolled straight into that and um, put into that, into that, the vacuum chamber will come down on top of it. Right. And if people want to see that at, after the show, go, go back, dig back into our YouTube feed for a cosmic coffee last June. Um, and we walked around the site a little bit and, and took a look at the coating tank. It's sort of a, a Blair telescope project thing. I was doing holding the, the phone and walking around the site. <laughs> So anyway, so right, so the day crew has gone out there and there's been this horrible grinding noise coming from the telescope. Right, which doesn't happen very often, but you know, sometimes it does. And so um, uh, we, we in fact had that recently with one of the um, guider cameras. Um, it was, it was not, you know, it wasn't a stop you in your tracks kind of a grinding noise, but it was something that you want to address before it gets to that point. And so, um, you know, that was something that they could take a look at and, um, uh, we actually swapped in the other guider um, to be used while this one was being diagnosed. Um, and yeah. so, you know, some, oh, go ahead. I remember one episode as an example of things. It's not necessarily the telescope itself, but, and of course, I think it was on a holiday weekend and the poor team had to go out there because there were, there were bolts on the floor uh, that had sheared off the, the dome somehow as, as we rotated. And I forget what the circumstances were, but, you know, what, Great. This this is what the Lowell team is like. I mean, they were out there fixing that and getting it back up and running on a holiday. Oh, absolutely. In yeah. fact, I mean, yeah, so I wasn't here when that happened, but I remember hearing about it. Um, but just in fact, this past Christmas, um, uh, Stephen Levine and I were out at the telescope on that evening and we arrived to find the loading bay very wet. Um, which is not something you like to see when you enter the telescope. <laughs> and it turned out that one of our um, heat tapes on one of the lines had failed and the, um, the pipe had burst and um, had drained probably 1,400 gallons worth of water from our tank into the loading bay. Um, and so, um, yeah, so uh, we had to quickly um, – figure out, so basically we had no water at the site at that point. And so we uh, were working on backcountry bathrooms for that evening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, <laughs> and then um, the our, our lead engineer um, actually w uh, came up the, um, I think it was the next day, he was in Tucson for the holiday, but he came back early to, to assess the situation and to figure out what had happened with that particular um, water line and was it critical and, you know, and so, and we were able to get a, um, another one of our team arranged for an emergency delivery of water. And so all over the Christmas holiday, you know, but that's, yep. that's when things go wrong. <laughs> yep. and that's, uh, I mean, that's certainly one of the hazards, particularly up in the telescope level, the, the equipment has to be resilient to a wide range of environmental conditions because we want Absolutely. that 
um, the same inside as outside. And at 8,000 feet in northern Arizona, that can be rather cold. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There is a, a second question also from Chris going back, um, uh, relating to the, the mirror coating, asking, I mean, we, we, we coat under vacuum, um, but what, what pressure do we pump down to before, before depositing the aluminum? And it's, it's way down there. It is way down there. I don't have a number for you, but it is a it is a really good vacuum. Um, you you could maybe do a, a, a future one on the, on mirror coating or something you like this. Do an entire yeah. show on mirror coating. Yeah, I, absolutely. It's in the realm of Microtor. That thing really bumps that's, it down to a near perfect vacuum. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry, I don't have any uh, more uh, exact numbers for that. But yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes the day crew, for instance, um, you know, after there's been a snow, after the snow has happened, one of the things we can't open the telescope if there's snow on the top of the dome, right? And so the, during the day, the day crew will, um, will be, um, you know, removing snow from the dome. And sometimes that's fairly simple. And, you know, if you just spin it around and point it at the sun, the sun will take care of it. And sometimes if there's been a buildup of ice, um, some, sometimes some of the day crew needs to go up there with all of their climbing gear, their harnesses on and chip, hang off the dome and chip away at the ice. Right. And, um, right. <laughs> Cause it's not atmosphere. That's, that's one of the, where that flat octagonal design of the dome really allows the snow to accumulate up there. It does. It does. And we've gotten some, you know, ice buildup in the tracks of the dome. So it makes it difficult for the dome to open. So, um, you know, there, there are some issues there that will, you know, that will need to get addressed during the daytime just in order that nighttime operations can then continue. And the day crew works, um, you know, really hard to make sure that the telescope is, is ready every single night. Right, right. So there's constant little reports and yeah, it's, as you say, it's a 24 seven and then the day crew sort of leaves and the, the telescope operators still have to arrive. And maybe we, we can get to night ops here in just a moment. There's a couple of, of interesting questions. Uh, um, uh, interesting third, third question here from Chris. Uh, what, what is the wildfire situation at the site? Mm, and that's certainly yes. something our, that's always on our minds. It is absolutely always on our minds. And um, the Forest Service does a really good job of doing fuel reduction in the in the area to prevent wildfires. Um, and so you'll see, you know, um, during um, certain times of the year when it's when wildfires are less. Um, less of a danger, then they'll come through and they'll do um, preventative burns um, to, to clear the area of the fuel build up. Um, and so we have been, um, and it's something that we look at on the site as well. So in fact, we just had the Forest Service out to look at some fuel reduction moves that we can do for the site because there's some areas where there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the small stubbly stuff that can kind of grow up and that that's pretty dangerous to, for wildfire because that will allow the wildfire to spread really quickly. And so we have a plan for next summer to do some fuel reduction directly on the site. And then the forest service is always taking care of the area around it as well. So we've been lucky so far and haven't had anything approach us closely. And we hope we've to continue that so streak. Yeah. yeah, well, we're certainly in an at-risk area for that in the midst Absolutely. of the huge ponderosa pine forest and the, the other, sort of that's that's the operational side uh, one thing i'll note you, you know the, at least the dct site on the prevailing wind side it's this old cinder cone that's been mined somewhat for cinders and there's a, it a, there's this cliff that doesn't really have any vegetation on it and you know that at least affords a level of protection from the prevailing direction the other practical impact um we got a nasty punch in the gut a couple of months ago you know we we were fortunate this year, but of course, many areas like California and Colorado this year were ravaged by wildfires. And the I think the insurance companies have gotten a wake up call as to their level of risk exposure. And so let, let me just say that the premiums to insure a $53 million asset in the middle of the forest took a rather stomach churning a uh, hike this year that I that I had to factor into the 2021 budget, which is in the midst of COVID, that's just what we needed, but it's the <laughs> way it is. Um, the second question from Avery Squires, wanting to know for both of us, have either of us ever been to space and do we want to go? And <laughs> I would say it would be awesome to see the world from the perspective of the ISS. And I understand it's a life-changing experience. Um, I, 
Probably not going to happen for me. There's a lot involved in going to space, but but it would be neat. What do you think? Amanda? Yeah. So I have not, but I would. That was my plan. That was my original plan, um, was to become an astronaut, and um, and yeah. So I, it did not happen <laughs> for a variety of reasons as well. Um, I have applied, and um, and um, but unfortunately, I was medically disqualified. So that seems pretty pretty uh, like like the end of that particular road. I have had friends who have made it further into the um, into the selection process. It's a very, yeah, as you said, Jeff, it's a very um, uh, stringent. There's a lot of testing that they do. And um, yeah, so yeah. I mean, uh, that that would just be amazing. Yep, yep. You, you don't just hop on the spacecraft and even um, civilians who have gone to space. You know, we had uh, Charles yeah. Simonia here last last year who gave this wonderful talk about his experience as a private citizen going to the, the ISS. Mm -hmm. And you don't just put people on the rockets and fire them off. There's there's a mm -hmm. lot that you have to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of my one of my one of my former students is is an astronaut or was an astronaut. And in fact, for a while there, he held the record for the longest um, time in space for an American. And wow. um, just uh, just amazing. I, I remember having some conversations with him because he contacted me um, at one point and, and was, you know, asking about some work I was doing with some Hubble Space Telescope time and how he wished he could get some. And I offered to trade him some HST time for some time on the space station. But that didn't work out. <laughs> okay, so maybe what we can do now, um, having sort of a glimpse of what goes on all day at LDT, we can talk about the night ops, which again is an involved procedure. You don't just casually flip the switch and then start taking taking data. There's a lot that goes into this. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I'm, I, before we switch over to night ops, one of the things I do want to mention about daytime operations is there's science going on in the daytime as well, because we have the um, Lowell Observatory Solar Telescope, which is um, mounted on um, the top of the Ox building. And there's a fiber feed into one of our instruments at, at, the, at the main telescope. And so it's taking data, you know, during the daytime, pointing at the sun. That's um, right. And, Yep. So um, it can, you know, data collection can happen almost 24 hours a day. And but um, so but at nighttime, nighttime for us starts before nighttime um, because the um, telescope operator needs to arrive um, usually an hour and a half before sunset um, because the startup of the telescope it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Like you said, Jeff, it's not just a, a switch that you flip. You have to. There's a whole procedure that the telescope operator will go through to get the telescope ready for operations that evening. And, um, you know, you can, you can do it in less time than an hour and a half, but you want to leave a little bit of buffer so you can make sure, you know, in case anything, you need to investigate anything or in case the observer wants to you know, get started with um, some sky flats or something like that before sunset, then we want to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. So roughly an hour and a half is when the telescope operator will arrive. And, the um, there the startup procedure. There's several parts of it. We basically what we need to do, um, what the telescope operators need to do, is to bring all of the subsystems online. And so there are um, there are procedures for that. There's software procedures. So basically, the um, the, the telescope operator will walk around. Um, we'll do a just an inspection just to make sure that there's nothing. You know, there there weren't any screwdrivers left. You know, on the you know, someplace on the observing floor that might fall into the mirror or something like that. There, you know, that's not something that happens, but we want to make sure that that's going to be the case. We want to make sure that there's nothing, you know, poking, that there's not a ladder that was, you know, maybe, um, you know, hit and then is poking into the dome so that when we start spinning the dome, it might get caught up. So there's a bunch of just checks that the operator will do like that. And then they'll just start bringing up the subsystems. And so there are um, a number of them. We, one of the things we need to bring up is the adaptive optics control system for the mirror to make sure that the mirror is supported. It's a, it's not an, it's not a, um, it, it, I'm not sure what I said. I meant active optics. I might've said adaptive, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's not an adaptive optic system. So we're not responding to the um, changes in the atmosphere. It's an active optic system. So what we're doing is supporting the mirror, which, which accounts for um, changes basically due to gravity from when the mirror is pointing like this versus when the mirror is pointing like this. But we need to engage that active optic system so that the mirror is supported um, when it starts to move. 
And then, um, you know, there's moving, um, booting up the telescope control system um, and um, a bunch of other just uh, uh, monitoring um, tools for the, for the operator to make sure that all of the temperatures are good, all of the pressures are good, um, that we know where the telescope is pointed. Um, we do a pointing check at the beginning of the night. Um, we do a, a physical pointing check where we're just um, looking at the at the marks on the telescope to make sure that it's at points where it should be. And then we actually do an on sky pointing check, going to look at a star to see, you know, does that does that um, star show up where we're expecting it to be? Um, and then there are a number of um, of um, uh, procedures that the uh, operator will go through to adjust the um, the support of the mirror. It's called a wavefront analysis. And so we um, we do that by looking at a star, putting in the Shack Hartman, Shack Hartman um, rig so that we can separate the um, image of the star into a bunch of little points. And then looking at how the how we can adjust the shape of the mirror to make the star image as perfect as we can get it. And at that point, um, we're ready to hand over the telescope to the observer. And so then the observer will do the kinds of you know calibrations that they need to do before starting to observe for the night on whatever their program is. Right. And so and we'll have two people on site. You've got the the telescope operator. Um, and and I think we've even said this jokingly on Cosmic Coffees before that the role of the telescope operator is to protect the telescope from the astronomer who's observing. Um, <laughs> but we'll have two people there, the, the TO running the facility and then the astronomer doing the observations with one or more of the instruments. Now we've had a couple of actually really good questions uh, coming okay. in um, about this side of things. So Chris asks if during periods with large day night temperature swings, is there any particular uh, preconditioning or normalization procedure and large temperature swings are sort of what we have here in Arizona. <laughs> That's absolutely what we have. That's right. And we don't do any active um, temperature um, stabilization. So I know that, you know, for instance, at the Naval Observatory, one of their telescopes, their dome is, is air conditioned to try to keep the temperature um, constant, more constant from day to night. But we don't do that. So one of the things we do do is when um, in the early in the startup procedure, we'll open up the, all of the doors, you know, on that dome, you can, you can, um, there, there are vent, ventilation doors all the way around that you can open up. And so, um, and on the mezzanine level as well. And that what we're trying to do there is get the telescope level um, equal to the outside temperature as as quickly as we can. Now, for some telescopes, this is this takes a long time because we have because those telescopes may have a very thick mirror, and it takes glass a while to you know to respond to temperature changes. But our mirror is quite thin; it's only four inches thick, I believe, and so um, it it can react more quickly to uh, changes in temperature. Having said that, that is a, it's still a thing we need to watch. And so for instance, one of the things, one of the monitoring things that the operator will, will look at is the, the mirror temperature and versus the outside temperature. And so if though, if the mirror temperature is changing quickly, then we generally don't do a wavefront solution at that point because it's just gonna keep on changing. We kind of wait until the temperature has stabilized a bit. Right, and of course the trade-off that we accept for having that that thin mirror that that adjusts to the con environmental conditions is the active optic system um, because it it flexes because it's thin and it, it can flex under its own weight. Um, so we we described that at some length in the last June's Cosmic Coffee as well. Interesting question. Uh, you can take the first part of this, and I think I can take the second part from okay. Greenbeer. Is the airspace around the observatory controlled to avoid? interference from aircraft, you just have to work around them. Also, any problems from Starlink? <laughs> yes, yes. So the answer is no, it's not. <laughs> we're not, we, uh, planes fly where they want to fly. Um, and we don't have any control of our airspace um, at all. And so we do have, you know, you can see some in some of the science images, there'll be an airplane going through it. Um, there'll be a satellite going through it. And so you can talk about Starlink. <laughs> Yes, and in, in fact, um, uh, on our, our live stream of the Great Conjunction, a plane flies right through the, uh, the, the live cam of Jupiter and Saturn. We have, I've got this great, this great still of this airliner photobombing Jupiter and Saturn, which is pretty neat. Um, the question for Starlink, um, how many hours do we have left in our show? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I was, I was just on a telecon yesterday um, with several 
um, members of the American Astronomical Society, other astronomers, but also with um, executives from uh, SpaceX, uh, OneWeb, and Amazon. We're having a session at next week's American Astronomical Society meeting about this. We've been, uh, I at Lowell and, and a number of people in the astronomy community have been working for over a year, since the, the year and a half, since the first Starlink launch on the surprisingly bright um, appearance of these communication satellites. Um, and that brightness combined with the sheer number um, really could create severe impacts for ground-based astronomy. And I, I want to say that the companies have been very receptive and very sincerely proactive. You know, they are aerospace companies, so they think space is cool and you know, they've got a mission and they're gonna do it, but they also think astronomy is cool and they want to do what they can uh, to help. And so, so we've been working with them um, and SpaceX has been working hard to redesign its satellites and make them somewhat fainter. That said, for a telescope like LDT, they are incredibly bright. And if, if they do photobomb an image, they will, the main streak of the satellite will saturate pixels. Um, a sufficiently bright streak will create crosstalk. Uh, this is particularly a problem for facilities coming online like the Vera Rubin Observatory, which are what we call very high atom dew facilities. So they have a huge field of view and they're sweeping large areas of sky. LDT, my, I, I can imagine we will see some photobombing by Starlink, but even our main imager has a considerably smaller field of view than, than some of these, these largest facilities. But, you know, the impacts are, are definitely there. And, and we just, it's, it's the landscape in space right now because of the changes in technology and easy access to space from the private sector. So we just have to work with it and, and deal. Um, question, we went back, I was going to mention when we said sky flats for everybody's Clarification, those are basically calibration images and question from um, Terry uh, Jennings, don't know if I pronounced that right. How many sky flats do you take and are they used for one night or can be used for multiple runs? Yeah, so a sky flat, it, it is a calibration image and it's for imaging or you can also take them for spectroscopy, but there's some issues there, um, but mostly imaging. Let's just stick with that for now. Um, and what we're measuring there is basically um, any uh, pixel to pixel variation within the detector and then also um, obstructions within the light path. So we can see, for instance, it, within sky flats, you can get, um, you can see um, the shadow of a, of a speck of dust that is somewhere, you know, on the filter or on the, um, on the window to the, to the detector. And it'll be a little bit out of focus. So it'll be a dust ring. Um, and what it does is it's blocking a little bit of the light from, you know, from your target. And so if you take these flats and then you um, put them into your calibration um, process, then what you can do is basically account for the fact that there's a little bit of light blocked there by that dust speck or vignetted or, you know, or just, again, dealing with that pixel to pixel sensitivity variation. Mm -hmm. um, and so the observer, it really depends upon the science um, uh, needs of the observer. So uh we also have a um we also have a, a flat screen on the dome that we can use but um, i think that you know people often like to just get sky flats instead uh, um yeah they tend to be more applicable to the to ordinarily the, i mean you would get a fresh set pretty frequently because dust you, would. you wouldn't use the same yeah. glass you know, things things you would yeah so i mean if you're if you're doing a bunch of filters in that evening then you need to get a flat for a set of flats for every filter and you don't get just one, you get three or five or 10 because you need to take a median of them. And so, and then, you know, if you're doing this, so it, it really gets kind of complicated. If you've got 10 different filters you need to get flats for, then it gets difficult to get all of them within that, within that twilight period before it gets dark enough for the, um, you know, for stars to start showing up. So it can actually get really complicated. And so basically don't ever talk to an astronomer while they're doing sky flats because it's a, it's a very time critical <laughs> procedure. You're trying to get a lot done in a short period of time. Yeah. And for, and then often on the spectroscopic side, what we will do is take like a white light source and just shine it through the, the spectrograph and put that blank uh, spectrum onto the detector. And that reveals the gain variations pixel to pixel and lets you see the blaze yeah. and all this that you can then take out. So they're different, uh, different techniques we would, often use when we're doing uh, spectroscopy. Um, the, there's a question from Chris, quickly going back to the, the Starlink issue, I'm, I'm sure this is what this, would it be possible to provide a shutter synced by ephemeris data? 
Um, that's been discussed. Um, there are real complications with that. Um, it depends on the type of exposure you're doing, the duration of the exposure, the length of the closure. And actually, one thing that we've, we've pointed out to the satellite operators, we need much more accurate ephemerides than they typically provide. And that's not them being careless or thoughtless. It's just they're working with the precision they need and the precision we need for these small fields of view. Um, we need improved uh, TLEs or two-line elements, perhaps by a factor of about 10. And, and that's that's one of the, the unfunded mandates that's coming out of, of, of the whole satellite constellation uh, issue. Um, and, um, and, and how long does it take to transit the sensor area, um, that's that's a good question. It's it's fairly fast, um, you know, um, it, and it depends on the altitude. And that's actually one of the counterintuitive things that we've uh, uh, agreed upon as the result of our satellites workshop last June. Um, it might seem you'd want the satellites to be as high as possible so that they're fainter. It's actually better to fly them low because they're much less visible. They're only visible an hour or two after sunset or before sunrise, because that's the only time of night they're outside of the Earth's shadow. Um, higher up, they can be visible all night long. They move more slowly, so it's, it, it's not the brightness of the satellite, it's how much light they're stamping into each pixel. Um, and, and if they're moving slower, and then the really insidious thing, at higher altitudes, they're more in focus to these big research telescopes. And so the light is more concentrated. Um, so that's a, that's a complex issue that has not been solved, but certainly something observatories are gonna need to think about. Um, um, so then the final, there's a question going to going back, sort of how the, the active optic system, and this might require one of our engineers to answer to the, the last degree, what's the mechanical actuation for the active optics? I mean, there's basically there's 120 of them that sit on that's the right. back of the mirror. There are these little, um, these little, uh, the little like pencil things that kind of poke up at the at the back of the telescope, at the back of the mirror, and they are all individually controlled, controllable, um, and um, they, you know, we can what we can do is we can read off the signal from them, so we know exactly where they are, and then we can send the signal to them, so we can move them, you know, by microns to just make a very small change to the back of the telescope, to the back of the uh, mirror. And so what we have is over from the, from the commissioning stage, you know, um, of the telescope, we have a bunch of um, information from doing the tests at that point to say, okay, when we're pointing in this direction, then we need to have extra force here and a little bit less force over here. Um, and so we basically have a map that we can interpolate and say, okay, well, with this pointing, we'll need to you know, put this in and we can just keep on changing that as we move the telescope across the sky. However, that's not the only thing that is necessary. It's not just um, it's not just a function of the pointing of the telescope, it's also a function of the temperature. And, you know, so we have some information, but it wasn't taken at all temperatures. And so that's something that we're continuing to collect data on so we can improve the, um, the active optics um, maps for, the, for this telescope. Okay, great. So, all right, where, where to now? Are we uh, is there more to talk about on the night ops side or do we want to talk about the Mesa? So bit? yeah, during the, I think that during the, um, the only thing I, I guess I'll, I'll just say is, um, you know, during the night, the, once the telescope operator gets the telescope running, um, you know, the, the observer will then start taking their data. The operator will help out with, um, selecting guide stars. So for instance, if the if the observer wants to take a 30 minute exposure of some something, some galaxy or something, then it might benefit, you know, the telescope tracks really well and points really well, but still it might benefit from having a little bit of guiding to make the um, to make the image even more stable. And so the, the operator will um, select a guide star and then just monitor that guide star. And then as that star maybe moves a little bit, um, we'll take, we'll measure the position of the guide star and then send those offsets back to the telescope um, pointing system. And so that'll keep the telescope very, um, very uh, accurately pointed at the target. And um, sometimes um, you mentioned this before, Jeff, sometimes some observers want to change instruments and maybe use, you know, LMI and then switch over to um, Express or Javini or one of the spectrographs, and so we have that op we have that option at LDT, which is a great great aspect of the telescope. Other sometimes you know for some other telescopes, in order to do an instrument change, 
that needs to be done during the day where the day crew will physically go in, take one instrument off and put another instrument on. Yeah. But we have, um, I think it's five instruments currently co-mounted. And so we, what we can do is we just have a mirror set of mirrors. And so we can just, it takes five minutes for the, for the operator to just flip the mirror and say, okay, now you, now the mirror is pointing over here. And so you can go ahead and use that, that instrument. And then in the morning, um, you know, if the observer wants to do morning flats, then we'll do that. And otherwise um, in the morning, the, the operator will close up the facility um, record any anything weird that happened during the night so the the day crew when they come in an hour or an hour later will be able to get started right on it and then we start our day all over again right right and it's hard to overestimate the advantage of those deployable mirrors for the instrument switching um because we can slice and dice nights we, we schedule down to quarter nights i believe so that we can splice in other programs or literally if something unexpected happens like a supernova goes off, you know, we can be there in minutes and, and get these, these really interesting observations of transient and unexpected phenomena. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So uh, one, one question, how do we protect this very expensive equipment from storms, which is a good, a good question. That's, that is a great question. And that is one of the, um, one of the, uh, jobs of the telescope operator is to also always have an eye on the weather. Um, and so um, we we have closure criteria or we have criteria that will prevent us from opening. So we have a humidity criterion and wind and um, particulates. So smoke, you know, something like that, because um, if, if, there, if we were to get smoke particles on the mirror, they're actually, um, I, I've heard that they're acidic and so they can actually um, eat through that, that coating that we have on the mirror and that would require us then to um, re recode it more frequently and we don't yeah, want to. Yeah, that's certainly that. a, a choice we regularly have to make you know, when the Forest Service does the controlled burns, you know, it takes the smoke the wrong direction sometimes and often they do those like in June when during some of the most beautiful observing weather, but you know, I, I will take a healthy forest and a, a reduction in fire danger over a few lost observing nights for sure. I know it, it's always painful though, but yes, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. So um, at the beginning of the night, you know, the, the telescope operator will check all of the environmental um, you know, systems and just to make sure that we're, we're within um, the um, operable ranges for everything. And then if that's the case, then we'll open. But during the night, it's, you know, the, there's a, there's always a, you know, the weather radar and the clouds, you know, we've got all of those going all the time. And so the operator is always checking those. And so one of the things we do worry about is humidity, because if the, um, that's another thing that's a no, no for mirrors, you don't want them to get wet. Um, and if it's if the night is too humid, then that is what will happen uh, um, to the mirror that, you know, it'll just get fogged in and it'll it's not good for the objects at all. And so if the humidity rises above 85 percent, then we do need to close the facility. Um, and we and then and sometimes, you know, that happens sometimes because in the um, because as at night when it gets colder, um, whatever water is in the air, you know, might be uh would lead to a lower humidity during the daytime when it's warmer, but then as the temperature drops, then the relative humidity actually rises. And, you know, the, sometimes the telescope operator will actually go out and just, you know, touch the railing just to see, you know, how is water condensing on cold things, cold surfaces? And if the answer is yes, then we can't open or we have to close. And another motivation to do the shutdown during monsoon when we have just these sopping wet nights when the gulf moisture is present and the humidity is just way elevated. Um, a question of whether the California wildfires affected our observing this year. We definitely had some days of pretty much, even over here in Flagstaff, overcast with smoke. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know the answer we used because of particulates from the California wildfires, but I know that it was definitely affecting the transparency of our of our night skies yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and oh, a question, and this is asked in relation to the mirror, but applies to the whole facility concerning uh, active ventilation. We ventilate the mirror at or below dew point, and and how do we handle that? We do have fans that um, go through the that the the um, the telescope body to to try to you know stabilize that temperature, um, right? Yeah, I as well as in the dome and in the yeah yeah. Right, we've got these big um, sort of garage doors 
uh, both on the observing level, there's, uh, well, seven of them plus the slit, and then several down on the mezzanine level to just let the whole dome above the observer's room ventilate and equilibrate, basically. We're, Absolutely, it's yeah. Temperature control. Um, yep. and, and we want to keep the mount. We want to keep the mount cold too, too, because I mean, if there's if it's if it's warm on that mezzanine level, that's going to make it up into the observing level. So yeah, absolutely, it's all about that temperature control. Yep, yep, yep. And if you want to see uh, how some of those things work, again, uh, look back in our Cosmic Coffee series from last June um, out at the LDT. At, um, I forget what number it was, but we, I was out there uh, with my iPhone and we were walking around the facility. So um, it's a little bit more of the technical aspects of how these subsystems work and not so much on the actual ops, but, you know, it's complimentary. All right. Uh, um, usually try to go for about 45 minutes here, Amanda. So uh, about five minutes um, left. Um, I would ask uh, Danielle and Richard behind the scenes, maybe have viewers type in any final questions. Are there any other things you'd like to cover uh, in our, our show today? Um, I, uh, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes on on the site. And I think we, we've touched on that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if you wanted to touch on any of the other sites. We don't have very much time left, but um, um, you we know. could, we could, uh, if you just want to briefly um, summarize, I mean, obviously LDT is our largest telescope, but we do operate another site and maybe just a quick summary of those facilities and we can come back to them in more detail on a future. The next time we do a day in the life of the telescope, maybe we could do the 42 and, and some of the, the programs, uh, well, obviously one that I've been involved with for um, 10 years. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So I, we have another site. Um, at um, another research site, it's on Anderson Mesa, um, out um, uh, off of Lake Mayer Road. And so we have a, over there, we have a 42 inch telescope, um, which Jeff just alluded to. And then we also have a 31 inch telescope and we have our um, interferometer, the NPOI, the Navy prototype, uh, precision, sorry, optical interferometer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these sites as well will be having, you know, their own um, day night cycles. Um, the 42 inch is a an observer controlled telescope. So there isn't a separate um, telescope operator um, for that one. So that for that one, the observer will run the telescope as well as the instrument. It is um, it is a much simpler telescope to operate. And so it's uh, much easier to do that there. The, um, the interferometer has um, um, observer technicians. And so at that site, the, um, plus a, a, a very active day crew as well, working on, on just getting, making sure everything is working there. And at that site, the nighttime observer techs will um, not only run the array, but will also gather the data for the observers. Yep. Yep. And I, I can certainly attest, you know, um, all of my research observing um, a program we have actually just concluded um, as of January 1st of this year after 20 oh, wow. years. Because, well, because the express and lost um, overlap it and supersede it. And so it's just made it obsolete. And but yeah, that, that's a much simpler operation. And, and the 42 inch really is like you go out there and and fire up the power to the telescope in the dome and then go downstairs and fire up the power to the instrument and boot the computer and you're pretty much ready to go and start taking your your early your start of evening flats and then yeah it's just bouncing around from star to star all night with with the one operator pretty much controlling everything but even so you know things there will go wrong and you could leave a report and then the tech crew will go That's out right. there and see what's going on with that telescope during the day okay we do have a few final questions before we um sign off um from, oh, this is this is a good one. This is a good one from uh, Lokesh Nagar. Do researchers do our researchers ever view things by eyepiece, or principally just collect uh, collect the data via computers and digital images? And um, the answer <laughs> yeah. is the answer is both. And and I almost mentioned this when you said we have five instruments on the D, on the LDT right now because sometimes one of those instruments was an eyepiece, and it's pretty amazing. That's right. And that's an amazing opportunity at the LDT because there's not a lot of large telescopes like that that actually have the ability to put an eyepiece on the back of it. And yet at the LDT, we can put an eyepiece on the back. And it is it is just amazing. It is wonderful. It's spectacular. I can't even say enough about it um, yeah. to be able to just see 
through yeah. a telescope of that right, size. Right, and, and with yeah. that much glass, I think the thing that blows me away the most are the colors in yeah. the neighborhood, because you've got enough light coming off the glass to fire the, the cones in your eye, and you're seeing these right. glowing green and pink clouds of right. glass. Because normally there's not enough to do that, but yeah, here you can. Um, and and so I mean there there is that opportunity. Most of the researchers though will be using some sort of inst of instrumentation um, to to collect their photons and then take it away and, and analyze it during the daytime. That's right. That's the vast majority, of course, is collected digitally, um, whether that's by the observer directly or you know a lot of facilities these days are robotic. And you know earlier yeah. in the show we were talking about Starlink and mentioned. The Vera Rubin Observatory, which which will just gobble down data at a staggering rate, and and in fact so much that how we reduce and analyze and make that data accessible has been a a, a real topic of thought for that program because the the data volume is so overwhelming. Um, and I will notice note that um, for observing at the forty two inch, you know, we did have to align the telescope every night. And the standard way to, to do that, we had, there was a finder scope mounted on the side of this one meter telescope. And you would literally be up there with the, you know, mortal combat paddle and centering the star in the crosshairs and then go back downstairs. And sure enough, there it would be on the TV in the pickoff mirror. So, so we use eyepieces um, for different purposes for a variety of ways. Um, That's true. All right. Last question I see on the feed, another, another really good one. And we alluded to this before when we were, trying to see if we use the right word or not. Do we have artificial guide star capability? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, no, we don't, we don't have, we don't have adaptive optics and we don't have uh, the ability to, um, to, to, you know, send a laser up into the sky and, and use that for anything like this. Although we have some potential projects on the, on the um, coming up in the future, maybe in that direction. So right. we'll see. Right, and AO capability is required for certain applications at the interferometer, of course, but that's a whole other can of worms for yet another another cosmic coffee. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so what we will do then is get ready to wrap here and say thanks to everyone for joining us. We'll definitely bring Amanda back and maybe we can talk about um, the 31 and the 42 inch telescope. Uh, they're both grand old war horses. You know, they've been in service for a long time. The 31, <laughs> arguably past its its more useful days and, and we're actually talking about an upgrade to that. So so we will come back with a future cosmic coffee and, and talk about a life in the day of all those telescopes because they're much smaller aperture but very interesting in their own right. So with that I will say many thanks Amanda for your time joining us. We'll look forward to some more cosmic coffees. What one thing we're going to try to do this year in 2021 is pursue these cosmic coffee shows among different different threads. Uh, so we might talk about technical matters. We might talk about more pure astrophysical matters. So as so we get kind of a, a cadence here going in, in the shows and, and cater to a variety of interests and topics. So until next week, as always, we'd like to say be healthy, be safe, hang in there. There's, there's light at the end of the tunnel, even if it seems that perhaps the world is crumbling around us, uh, things, things will get better. Um, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week.